and upon seeing him come, would tug their owners into doorways and up court. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Once upon a time, and of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, Old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy with all, and he could hear the people in the court go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had just gone three, but it was already quite dark. The fog poured in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense without, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. The door to Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tent, sat copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's file was so very much smaller, it looked like one coal, but he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so shortly as the clerk came in with the shovels, the master predicted it would be necessary for them to part. Whereupon, the clerk put on his great comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle. In which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he fell. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. He had so heated himself with rapid walking through the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that he was all in a glow. His face was ruddy and handsome. His eyes sparkled. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! Bah! Humbug! What Christmas a humbug? You don't mean that I do. Merry Christmas! Out upon Merry Christmas! What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without any money? A time for being a year or not an hour richer? If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly to his heart. Oh, go. Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Ha, 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 keep it. But you don't keep it. Come, and dine with us tomorrow. I'll see you in hell first. But why? Why? Good afternoon. I ask nothing of you. I want nothing from, from you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. Well, I'm sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute, but I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last and so a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon and a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. His nephew left the room first, but stopped at the outer door that he might bestow the season's greetings on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was much warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. <coughs> mm. There's another fellow, my clerk, with fifteen shillings a week, and a wife and a family talking about Merry Christmas. I retire to bedlam. The clerk, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, let Two other people, they were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and stood now with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley, I believe, have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Well, we have no doubt his liberality 
is well represented by his surviving papa at this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge. It is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common comforts. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common necessaries. Are there no prisons? <laughs> Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? They are, though I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor then. Both very strong, sir. I was afraid from what you had said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. I'm very glad to hear it. They're under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind and body to the masses, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. <laughs> oh, you, you wish to be made anonymous. <laughs> I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I do not make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle merry people. I support those institutions I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. But, but many can't go there, Mr. Scrooge, and many would rather die first. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentleman withdrew, and Scrooge resumed his labors with a much improved impression of himself. <laughs> Foggier yet, and colder. The owner of one scant young nose, gnawed by the hungry cold as dogs gnaw upon bones, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole that he might regale him with a Christmas carol. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. We met Scrooge, seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the farm, an even more congenial frost. <laughs> At length, the time for closing up the counting house had arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank <coughs> instantly snuffed out his candle and put on his hat. You'll be wanting all day tomorrow. If, if quite convenient, sir. Well, it is. It's convenient. And it isn't fair, too, if I were to withhold half a crown for it. You'd think yourself ill-used, I'd give up, and yet you don't think me ill-used when I must pay a day's wages for no work. It, it's only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pockets every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk agreed. And Scrooge, buttoning up his braider coat to the collar, went out. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long tails of his gray comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide at Cornhill in front of a lane of boys twenty times, then ran on home to Camden Town as fast as he could help to play at blind man's bluff. Scrooge took his usual melancholy dinner at his usual melancholy tavern, and after having read through all the newspapers and beguiled himself the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went on home to bed. 
He lived in chambers which had previously belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of room in a, a lowering pile of building up a yard where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancy it had run about there once as a young house, having played at hide and seek with the other houses, but had forgotten its way out again. It was old enough now and dreary enough for no one lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms having all been let out as offices. Now, it is a fact. There was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his entire stay in that place, and that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London. Let it also be born that Scrooge has, had not bestowed one thought on Jacob Marley since the mention of his seven years dead partner early that afternoon. And then let any man explain it to him, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having put his key in the lock on the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Molly's <gasps> pain. Marley's face. It was not in impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was neither angry nor ferocious, and looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. Its hair was curiously stirred, as if by breath or hot air, though its eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. As Scrooge looked upon this phenomenon, it became an awkward again. To say that he was not startled would be untrue, but he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in and, and lighted his candle. He did pause with a moment's resolution before he closed the door, and he did look behind at first as if he half expected the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on, so he said, Bah! and closed it with a bang. <coughs> the sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellar below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall slowly to trimming his candle as he went, for it was pretty dark. But up Scrooge went, not carrying a button for that. Darkness is cheap, and he liked it. <laughs> but before he closed his heavy door, he did walk through his rooms first to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room. Bedroom, lumber room, no one. No one in his closet. No one in his dressing gown, which was hanging in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Quite satisfied, he closed the door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. 
thus secured against surprise. He removed his cravat and put on his dressing gown and nightcap and slippers and sat down before the fire to take his groove. Scrooge's glance had happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose long forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked at it, the bell began to swing. It swung softly in the onset and scarcely made a sound. But soon, rang out loudly, as did every bell in the house. <coughs> this might have lasted half a minute or a minute, but it seemed like an hour. The bells ceased as they had begun together. They were succeeded by a loud, clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain across the casks in the wine merchant cellar below. Scrooge then remembered having heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. He heard the cellar door fly open with a booming sound, and then the noise, much louder on the floor, sent coming up the steps, then coming straight towards his door. <coughs> ah, it's, it's humbug. I, I won't believe it. His color pale, though, when without pause, he came on through his heavy door and passed into the room before his very eyes. Upon its coming in, the, the dying flame leaped up as if to cry, I know him! Molly's ghost! The same face. The very same. Mal in his pig tail, coat tail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots. The tassels on the latter bristling like his pig tail and coat tail and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail and was made up for Scrooge observed it closely. Cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses, all wrought in steel. His body was transparent so that Scrooge, observing it, and looking straight through the waistcoat could see the two buttons on the coat tail behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Molly had no bowels, but he had never believed it till now. No, nor did he believe it even now, though he looked the phantom through and through and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief about its head and chin. Oh, no. what, what do you want with me? March! Molly's voice, no doubt about it. Who, who are you? Back of the 
chance to save himself from falling into a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, removing the bandage from about its head and chin, as though it were too warm to wear indoors, his lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Why? Why do you torment me so? Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I, I do, I must, but why do spirits walk the other? Why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him walk upon the broad. Tonight, 
to warn you that you have yet but a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. You shall be haunted by three spirits. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The next upon the next night when the last stroke of midnight has ceased to vibrate. Good. Could I take a ball at once and have a double with Jacob? <laughs> look to see me no more. And look that for your own sake, you remember what has passed here between us. As it spoke these words, it picked up its wrapper from the table and bound it round its head as before. Scrooge knew this by the smart sound the teeth made when the jaws were brought together by the bandage. He ventured to raise a glance and found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude with its chain wound over and about its arm. The apparition walked slowly backwards from him. And with every step it took, the window raised itself up a little so that when the spectre had reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to advance, which he did. When they were within two paces of one another, Molly's ghost held up its hand, <coughs> warning Scrooge to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped, not so much in obedience as in fear and surprise, for on the raising of the window, he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory. The specter, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. The air was filled with phantoms, all wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Molly's ghost. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a, a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried out piteously at an, uh, a woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters. <laughs> but had lost the ability to do so forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed, and being from the emotions he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, 
much in need of repose, went straight to bed and fell asleep upon the instant. Touch of 
have my hand there upon your breast, and you shall be upheld in more than this. As these words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road with fields on either side. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be found. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a cold, clear winter's day with snow upon the ground. Good heavens! I, I was bred in this place. I, I was a boy here. Can you recollect the way? Remember it, I couldn't walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it all these years. They walked along the road, Scrooge remembering every gate and post and tree and until a little market town appeared in the distance with its church and bridge and winding river. Some shaggy ponies were now seen trotting towards them with boys upon their backs who cried out to other boys in open carts and country gigs driven by farmers. All of these boys were in great spirits and shouted to one another until the broad fields were so full of merry music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. These are but shadows of the things that have been. They have no consciousness of us. <clears throat> they walked along the road and left the highway and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick with a little weathercock surmounted cupola on the roof and a bell hanging in it. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes. Entering the dreary hall and glancing through the open doors of many rooms, they found them poorly furnished, cold and vast. There was a crisp, earthy savor in the air, a chilly bareness in the place which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candlelight and not too much to eat. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, across the hall, to a door at the back of the building. It opened and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room, made bare still by lines of plain deal forms and desks. At one of these, there sat a young boy reading near a feeble fire. Scrooge sat down upon a form and looked upon his poor forgotten self as he used to be. I wish. What is the matter? Nothing. Nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I, I should have liked to have given him something, is all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved its hand, saying as it did so, Let us see another Christmas. At this, Scrooge's former self grew, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrank, the windows cracked. Plast fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling and the naked lads were seen instead. But how any of this came about, Scrooge knew no more than you do. He only knew that it was quite correct, that there he was, alone again, while the other boys had gone home for the holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Suddenly, he glanced anxiously at the door. It opened and a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in. She threw her arms about his neck and kissed him again and again. Dear, dear brother, I've come to take you home. Dear brother, to take you home. Home, 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 for good and for all, all forever and ever. Oh, father, is so much kinder than he used to be. That home is like heaven now. He spoke so gently towards me as I was going to bed one dear night that I was not. 
said, Dad, if you had come home, and he said, yes, you should have sent me in a carriage to bring you, and you are to be a man, and are never to come back to this place ever again, but first, we are to be together all the Christmas long, and have the merriest time in all the world. She tugged him in her childish eagerness towards the door, and he, nothing loath to go, Such a delicate creature, whom a breath might have withered. But she had a large heart. So she had spirit. That much is true, but that didn't say it for me. She died a woman and had, as I believe, children. What child? True. Your nephew. Oh. oh, yes, yes. At that moment, they left the school behind them and now stood in the busy thoroughfares of a city. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that there too it was Christmas, but it was evening and the streets were lighted. The ghosts stood beside a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? <laughs> Why, I was apprenticed here. They went in. An old gentleman in a Welsh wig was sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches taller, he might have knocked his head upon the ceiling. Why, it's all fizzy with, it's all fizzy with, alive, again. Oh, fizzy with, laid down his pen and, and looked up at the clock which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands together, adjusted his capacious waistcoat and cried out loudly, You're out there, Ebenezer, Dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, gave him briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. <gasps> what? What is this? Dick Wilkins told me he's sure. Yo ho, my lads, no more work tonight. It's Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer, let's clear away and have plenty of room here. The floors were swept and Water. The lamps were trimmed, the fires made up, and the warehouse made to be as warm and dry and snug and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a big and went up to the high desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig. One vast substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came the maid and her cousin the baker. In came the cook and her brother's particular friend the milkman. In came the boy from across the way who was suspected of not having bored enough from his master, trying to hide behind the girl from next door, but one who, was, who it was proved had her ears pulled by her mistress. In they all came, one after the other, some boldly, some shyly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling, in they all came anyhow and everyhow. There were dances, and there were four bits, and there were more dances, and, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boil, and there were mint pies, and there was plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boil, when the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Bezzywig stood out to dance with Mrs. Bezzywig. Top couple, too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for the three or four and twenty pair partner. But 
if there had been twice as many. No, four times as many. Oh, Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like boots. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up, and Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everyone had retired except the two apprentices, they did the same to them. Scrooge's former self turned down the lamps, and the cheerful voices died away, and once again Scrooge and the spirit stood out in the open air. Quick, my time grows short. This was not said to Scrooge, nor to anyone whom he could see, but it had an immediate effect, for once again Scrooge saw himself. He was older now. A man in his prime. His face had not yet the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. There was a quick, eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye, which showed the seed that had taken root and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. He was not alone now, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a mourning dress, in whose eyes there were tears. The mother idol has displaced me, but if it can cheer and comfort you in later years, as I should have tried to do, I have no just cause to what idol has displaced you? A golden one. It is the even-handed dealing of the world. There is nothing on which it is so harsh as poverty, and nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. Oh, you fear the world too much. All of your hopes have merged into the one hope of being beyond its sort of reproach. I release you with a full heart and for the love of him you once were. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. And so she left him. In a 
an unbroken flood upon the ground. He suddenly became aware of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness and furthermore being in his own room. He gave the cat one final parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed and barely had time to reel to bed before falling into a deep and heavy sleep. <coughs> Awakening in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed to collect his thoughts, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that once again the hour was upon the stroke of one. He felt that he had been restored to full consciousness in the right nick of time for the especial purpose of holding a conference with the second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intercession. But, finding that he grew uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains this new spirit would draw back. He put them, every one, aside by his own hand, and lying back down, established a sharp lookout all around the bed, for he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance and not be taken by surprise and made nervous. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not, by any means, prepared for nothing. And consequently, when the bell struck one and no shape appeared, he fell into a violent fit of trembling. But all this time he lay upon the bed, the very core and center of a blaze of ruddy light which streamed upon it when the bell proclaimed the hour and which being only light was far more alarming than a dozen ghosts, for he was powerless to determine what it meant. At last he began to think that the very secret and source of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room from whence, upon further tracing it, it seemed to shine. This idea taking full possession of his mind he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. It was his own room. There was no doubt about it, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The very walls and ceiling were so hung with a living green that it looked to be a perfect grove from whence every part bright, gleaming, berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been placed there. Such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of the hearth had never known in Scrooge's town. Lying in easy state upon a couch, there sat a giant, glorious to behold, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it high, high up to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, come in and get to know me, better man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. The ghost was clothed in one simple, deep green robe or mantle bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capacious chest was bare. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it wore no other covering than a simple holly wreath set here and there with shining icicles. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Touch my robe! Scrooge 
did as he was told and held it fast. All vanished instantly. The room, the fire, the hour, the night, the ruddy glow. And they stood upon the city streets on Christmas morning. The sky was rather gloomy and even the shortest streets were so choked with a dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heaviest particles descended in a shower of sooty atoms as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had by one consent caught fire. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate or the town, and yet was there an air of cheerfulness abroad. The steeples called good people all to church and chapel, and away they came, flocking through the street with their gayest faces and best clothes. Scrooge and the Spirit walked along the street and into the suburbs and straight to Scrooge's clerk's house. Mrs. Cratchit, Bob Cratchit's wife, dressed out poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence, was laying the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property wet, and now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own, and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, danced all around the table and insulted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not too proud because of his collars, Blew on the fire until the slow potatoes, bubbling up, knocked out loudly on the saucepan, lit to be let out and peeled. Why, whatever has your precious father then, and your brother, Tommy Tim, and Martha weren't so late last Christmas by half an hour? Here's Martha, mother, cried the two young crutches. Oh, there's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart and love, my dear, right you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her again and again while removing her shawl and bonnet from her with a vicious seal. Well, never you mind, just so long as you are come. Sit you down before the farm, my dear, and have yourself all warm. No, no, here's Martha coming, cried the two young Cratchits who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide. So Martha hid herself, and in came young Bob, the father, with nearly three feet of comforter, exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes brushed and donned to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas, for poor Tiny Tim, he poor little crutch, and had his legs supported by an iron frame. Where's our Martha? Not coming. Not coming. Not coming upon Christmas Day. Martha didn't like to see him so disappointed, even if it were only a joke, and so she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran straight into his arms while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him to the water closet that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave today? <coughs> Asked Mrs. Cratchit when Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. Oh, as good as gold. And better. Sometimes he gets so thoughtful sitting by himself so much, he thinks the strangest things you have ever heard. He 
told me coming home, he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. He's growing strong and hearty, my dear. Tiny Tim's crotch was heard upon the floor. And back he came, Tiny Tim, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire, while Bob, turning up his cuffs, poor fellow, as if they were capable of being made any more shabby, compounded some mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred it round and round and set it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued, you would have thought a goose the rarest of all birds a feathered phenomenon to which a black swan were a matter of course, and in truth, it was something very much like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy ready beforehand in a little saucepan hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted off the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him at a tiny corner of the church table. And the two young Cratchits set chairs for everyone, not forgetting themselves and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths lest they should shriek for goose before it was their time to be served. And now, the plates being set upon, grace was said. For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. 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 It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking closely all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all across the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat upon the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't think there ever was such a goose cooked. It's Tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness, were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by the applesauce and the mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient meal for the entire family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit pointed out, surveying one tiny atom of a bone upon the plate, <gasps> Yet, everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped with sage and onion to the eyebrows. And now, the dinner being over with, the cloth was clear, the hearth was swept, the fires made up, the compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect. Apples and oranges were placed upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the cratchits drew round the hearth in what Bob called a circle, meaning half of them. And at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass. Two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff 
from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done. And Bob passed it out with beaming smiles, while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. And now, a toast. Merry Christmas, my dears. May God bless us. God bless us. Every one. Oh, Charles, write that before you forget it. God bless us. Every There are many sad and weird 
goodbye, my pretty flowers. There was nothing of high markedness. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. But they were happy. Pleased with one another, contented with the times. And when they looked happier still, in the bright sprinkling of the Spirit's torch, Upon parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially upon Tiny Tim until the last. By now, it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily, and as Scrooge and the spirit walked along the streets, the brightness of roaring fires in Kitchens, parlors, and all sorts of rooms was wonderful blessings on it. How the ghost exalted, how it bared its breadth of breast, and floated on, outpouring with a generous hand, its bright and harmless mirth on everything within its reach. <laughs> it was a great surprise to Scrooge to hear a hearty laugh. It was an even greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephews and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with standing next to the spirit and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. <laughs> he said, he said that Christmas was a humbug as I live, and he believed it too. To all the shame for him, Fred. Well, he is a comical old fellow. That much is true. And not as pleasant as he could be, but I'm sorry for him. I could be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers from his ill wits? Himself, always. Here, he puts it in his head to dislike us and won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He misses out on some pleasant moments which can do him no harm. I'm sure he misses out on more pleasant conversations than he can find in his thoughts, either in his moldy old office or dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same opportunity every year, whether he likes it or not, and I think I shook him yesterday. It was the company's turn to laugh now, the notion of his shaking Scrooge, but being entirely good-natured and not much caring what they laughed at, so long as they laughed in any case, he encouraged them in their many merriment. But once again, Scrooge and the Spirit were upon their travels. It was a long night if it were even a night, but Scrooge had his doubts of this because the Christmas holidays were condensed into the space of time they passed together. It was strange, too, that although Scrooge's outward form had not been changed, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it until they, st they stood next to each other after a children's twelfth night party. But a spirit's life's so short. My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Hark, the time is drawing near. The chimes were ringing the three quarters past eleven at that moment. Spirit, forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, but I see something strange and not belonging to yourself protruding from your skirt. Is it a foot? 
for a claw? It might be a claw for the flesh there is upon it. Look here. From the foldings of its robe, it drew forth two children. Wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. Oh, man, look here. Look, look down here. They were boy and a girl, yellow, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate too in their humility, where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints. A stale and shriveled hand, like that of age, pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Where angels might have sat and groaned, devils lurked and glared out menacing. No change, no degradation, no perversion of humanity in any degree to all the mysteries of wonderful creation, as monsters have so hard. And dread. Scrooge started back, appalled, spared. But are they yours? They are man's. Beware them both and all of their degree. But most of all, beware this boy. For upon his brow I see that written is doom, unless the writing be erased. This girl is ignorance, this boy is want. Deny it, slander those who tell it ye, admit it for your own factitious purpose, and make it end, and bind the time. They no resource or refuge? Are there no prisons? <laughs> Are there no workhouses? The bell struck twelve. Scrooge glanced about him for the ghosts and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, come like a mist along the ground towards him. Slowly, gravely, silently. The very air through which this phantom passed, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. But for this, it would have been impossible to detach the figure from the night and separate it from the darkness by which it was surrounded. Its mysterious presence filled him with a sullen dread. I did the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. The spirit answered not but point down to the ground. You, you are about to show me the shadows of the things that have not been, but will be in the time before us. Is that so spirit? The upper portion of the garment was contracted in an instant in its folds as if the spirit had inclined its head forward. That was the only answer he received. But Scrooge was 
all the worse for this. It thrilled him with a vague, uncertain horror to know that behind the dusky shroud were ghostly eyes intently fixed upon him. Lead on, spirit. Lead on, the night is waning fast, and it is ever precious to me. Lead on, spirit. Lead on. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, but there they were, in the heart of it, among the merchants who hurried up and down and cheaped the money in their pockets and conversed in groups and so forth as Scrooge had often seen them do. The ghost stood beside one little knot of businessmen, observing that its hand was pointed at them. Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, I don't know what happened in either case. I only know that he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. What whatever was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows. What has he done with his money? I haven't heard. He hasn't left it to me. He's probably left it to his company. That's all I know. Well, it's likely to be a very cheap funeral for poor my life. I can't think of anyone to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going so long as a lunch is provided. But I must be fed if I am to go. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Not another word. That was their meeting, their conversation, and their parting. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach such importance to conversations apparently so trivial. He looked about in that very place for his own image, but another man sat in his accustomed corner, and though the clock pointed to its usual time of day for being in that place, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that, that poured in through the front porch. But now, they left the busy scene and went into an obscure part of town, one where Scrooge had never penetrated before but recognized its situation and bad repute. The ways were foul and narrow, the shops and houses wretched, the people half-naked, drunken, slipshod, ugly, alleys and archways like so many cesspools disgorged their offenses of crime and dirt and life upon the straggling street and the whole quarter reeked with crime and filth and misery. Far in this den of infamous refute was a low-browed beetling house beneath a penthouse roof where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought and sold. Lying on the floor within, in piled up heaps, were rusty keys, locks, nails, hinges, scales and weights, and refuse iron of all sorts. Sitting in, among the wares in which he dealt, by a charcoal broke stone, made up of old bricks, was a grey-haired scoundrel, nearly seventy years of age, who smoked his pipe in all the luxury of calm retirement. Scrooge and the spirit had come into the presence of this man just as a woman carrying a large and heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman similarly laden came in behind her, and she too was closely followed by a man in faded black who was no less startled by the sight of them than they had been upon the recognition of each other. <laughs> Let the charwoman alone to be the first. Let the laundress alone to be the second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be the third. Ah, here's the chance. 
so jealous we three had to met here without being a tour? <laughs> well, you couldn't have met at a better place. Step into the power. The woman, who had already spoken, threw her bundle on the floor and sat down in a flaunting manner upon a stool, crossing her elbows to her knees and looking with a bold defiance at the other two. Who talks then? Who talks, Mrs. Dilber? Every person has the right to look after himself. He always did. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things such as these? Now some did back, I suppose. If he'd have wanted to keep these things after he was dead, wicked old soul, then why wasn't he more natural in his life? If he had been, he'd have had someone there to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying there, gasping out his last, there, alone, by himself. Open up that bundle, Joe, and let me know the value of it. But the gallantry of her friends would not allow of this, and the man in faded black, making the breach first, produced his plunder. It was not expensive. A seal or two, a pencil case, a, a pair of sleeve buttons, and a brooch of no great value. These were severally examined and appraised by old Joe, who chalked the sums he was disposed to give for each upon the wall and added them into a subtotal when he found there was nothing more to come. Mrs. Dilber was next. Sheets and towels, a little wearing apparel, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs, and a few boots. Her account was chalked up in the same manner. And now open up my bundle, Joe. Joe got down on his knees for the greater convenience of it, and after having unfastened a great many knots, dragged out some large and heavy row of some dark stuff. And now, what's this? Bed curtains? You don't mean to say you took them down, rings and all, with him lying there? Don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. Is blankets? What well, whose else's do you think? It's not likely he used to catch him without uh, without a coat, I dare say. Look here. I hope he didn't die of anything. Catching, eh? <laughs> I ain't too fond of his company to loiter about long enough for such things if he did. Oh, you could look through that shirt till your eyes ain't. You won't find a hole in it or thread bare place. It was the best he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it if it wasn't for me. What do you call wasting up? Put it on him to be buried in. Someone was fool enough to do it, but I took it right off him, I did. <laughs> Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror as they sat grouped about their spoils in the scanty light afforded by the old man's torch. He viewed them with a detestation and disgust which could hardly have been greater had they been obscene demons marketing the corpse itself. And now, he almost touched a bed. A bed, uncurtained bed, on which, beneath a ragged sheet, there lay something covered up, something which, though it was dark, announced itself in awful language. The room was very dark. Too dark to be observed in any accuracy, though Scrooge glanced about him in obedience to a secret impulse, anxious to discover what kind of room it was. He looked at the ghost and noticed that the ghost's steady hand was pointed at the head. 
The cover was so carelessly adjusted that the slightest motion, the movement of a finger upon Scrooge's part, would have disclosed the face. He looked, he lay in the dark, empty house. A cat was tearing at the, at the door, and the sound of gnawing rats could be heard coming from the hearthstone, what they wanted in that room of death, and why they were so restless and disturbed, Scrooge dared not to think. Spirit, I understand you, and I would do it if I could, but I have not the power, Spirit. I have not the power. Again, it seemed to look upon him. But, Spirit, if there is any person in this town who feels emotion caused by the death of this man, show that person to me now, Spirit, I beseech you. The phantom spread its dark robe about him in an instant, and withdrawing it, revealed a room by daylight where a mother sat with her children. She was waiting for someone, and with anxious eagerness. At last, the long-expected knock was heard. She hurried to the door and met her husband, a man's face who was restless and careworn, though he, he was young. There was a remarkable expression in it now, a kind of serious delight in which he felt ashamed and which he struggled to repress. Is it good or bad? Bad. We, we are quite doomed then. No, there is hope yet, Caroline. If he relents, there is nothing is past such a miracle. If such a miracle has happened, he's past relent. He is. She was a mild and patient creature. If her face spoke truth, but she was thankful in her soul to hear it. And she said so with clasped hands. Oh, she prayed forgiveness in the next moment, but the first was the emotion of the heart. To whom? To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know. But we will be ready with the money before then, Caroline. We may sleep tonight with light hearts. Yes. Soften it though it would, their hearts were lighter. The children's faces hushed and clustered round to hear what they so little understood were brighter, and it was a happier house. For the death of that man, the only emotion the spirit could show him connected to an event was one of pleasure. Spirit, let me see some tenderness connected to a death. With this dark chamber, will forever be present to me. The ghost conveyed him through several streets familiar to his feet, and they soon entered poor Bob Cratchit's house to find the mother and her daughters and her children sitting round the glowing fire. Quiet very quiet. The once noisy Cratchits were as still as statues in a corner and sat looking up at Peter who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in sewing, but surely they were quiet. The mother laid her work upon the table. The color hurts my eyes and I wouldn't show you guys to your father when he gets home for the world. It must be near his time. But I think he's walked a little slow these past few evenings. 
again. They were very quiet. I, I learned to walk with a tiny tip upon his shoulder. And very fast, too. But he was so very light to carry it. Your father loved him, so it was no trouble. No trouble. And there's your father at the door. His tea was ready for him on the hob. And they all tried who should help him to it first. Then the two youngest Cratchits climbed each child upon his knees and laid a little cheek against his face as if to say, Don't fight it, Father. Don't be grieved. But he was very cheerful with that, and spoke pleasantly to all the family. You, <coughs> you went to stay then, Robert. Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how very green a place it is. But you shall see it often. I promised him we would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child, my little child. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, then he and his child would have been farther apart perhaps than they were. At last, he left the room and went upstairs to the upper room, which was hung with Christmas and lighted cheerfully. A chair was set close beside the bed where Tiny Tim used to sleep. He sat down and when he had thought a little and composed it, He leaned forward and touched the pillow where Tiny Tim's weary little head used to rest. He was reconciled to what had happened. And went down again. And they drew about the fire and talked, the mother and daughters working still. Bob told them of the extraordinary kindness of Mr. Scrooge's nephew, whom he had scarcely met but once early in the afternoon, and who, seeing that he was just a little down, you know, inquired as to what had happened to distress him so, on which said Bob, for he is the most pleasant spoken gentleman you have ever heard. I told him. I am heartily sorry to hear it, my dear Mr. Cratchit, and I am heartily sorry for your good wife. It really seemed as if he had known our tiny tale and felt with us. But whenever and however we part among us, my dears, I know that we shall none of us forget poor tiny tale, shall we? For this first party there was among us. No, father. And I know, I know, my dears, that when we recollect how very patient and mild he was, although he was a little child, we shall none of us quarrel among ourselves and forget Tiny Tim in so doing. No, Father, never. 
I am very happy. Said Bob, I am very happy. Spirit, our time is coming to an end. I know it, but no, not her. Tell me, what man was that whom we saw lying on the bed? The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him as before until they reached an iron gate, a churchyard. Here then, the wretched man whose name he had yet to learn lay underneath the ground. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed downward towards one. Scrooge advanced, <coughs> trembling as he did so. The ghost was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw new meaning in its solemn shape and hood. Before before I draw near to that stone to which you point out so me this, are the shadows of the things that will be? Or are they the shadows of the things that might be only? The ghost pointed downward to the grave. Men's ghosts foreshadow certain events to which if persevering they must conclude, but if the causes be departed from the ends will change. Say, it is thus with what you showed me. The spirit was immovable as ever. And Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he did so. And following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. <gasps> Am I the man who lay upon the bed? The finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. Transports 
by the churches ringing the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Rushing to the window, he threw it open and put out his head. Right, clear, jovial, stirring, cold, cold, pounding for the heart to dance on. Golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet, fresh air, merry music, oh, glorious, glorious. Scrooge called down to a young boy in Sunday clothes. What's today? And he returned the boy. What's today, my fine fellow? Today? <laughs> Why, it's Christmas Day. <gasps> it's Christmas Day? I, I missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like. Of course they can. Oh, oh, oh. Hello, my fine fellow! Hello! Oh, tell me, do you know the boat was on the next street but one at the corner? I should help I did. <laughs> An intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Tell me, do you know whether they sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there in the window? The big one! What? The one as big as me? <laughs> Boy, it's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my butt, it's hanging there now. It is. Well, go and bite and tell the man to bring it here that I might tell him the direction where to take it. Then you'll come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off in a shot. I just sent it to Buck Cratchit. He shot no horse and said, Scrooge went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the Potter's man. As he stood there waiting for his arrival, the knocker caught his eye. I scarcely ever looked at it before. What an honest expression it has in its face. I shall love it forever. Oh, and here's the turkey! Oh, oh, who this slay? A merry Christmas to you! It was a turkey! It never could have stood on its own legs, that bird. They would have snapped short off in less than five minutes, like sticks of sealing wax. What? It's, it's impossible to carry that! Oh, a weight of ganja down you must have a gab! <laughs> The chuckle with which he said this, and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey, and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab, and the chuckle with which he recompensed the boy were only exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down in his chair again and chuckled until he cried. And in the afternoon, he got himself dressed all in his best, and went out into the streets. The people were by now pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present, and walking with his hands clasped behind his back, he regarded them all with delighted smiles. He looked so irresistibly pleasant in <laughs> a word that Three or four good-humoured fellows said, Good morning, sir! A Merry Christmas to you, sir! And as Scrooge often said afterwards, of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard in his life, those were the blithest in his ears. But he had scarcely gone far when, coming on towards him, he beheld <laughs> One of the portly gentlemen who had come into his office the day before had sent a pang across his chest to think what this old man would look upon him and think. But he knew the course that lay before him, and he took it. My dear sir, how are you? Scrooge took the old gentleman by both his hands. I I hope you were successful yesterday in your endeavors. It was very kind of you. God bless you. Mm. Mr. Scrooge? <laughs> yes, that, that is my name. And, and I fear it may not be very pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your forgiveness. And, and will 
You do me the honor, sir. Here, Scrooge leaned forward and whispered in his ears. My, my dear Mr. Scrooge, I, I don't know what to say to such munificence. Don't say anything. Don't say anything at all. A great many back pain that I included in that. I assure you, come and see me. Will you come and see me? I, I, I will. I thank you. I thank you 50 times over. God bless you. I'm much obliged to you. And in the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed by the front door a dozen times before he finally had the courage to run up and knock. But he made a dash and he did it. A young housemaid <coughs> answered. <coughs> Hello, my dear. Is, is your master at home? Yes, sir. Is he upstairs? Yes, sir, he's upstairs in the dining room, sir, along with the mistress. I'll show you up if you like. Oh, no, no, I, I know the way. Thank you. Scrooge sidled his face in round the door. Why, bless my soul, who's that? <laughs> it's I, Fred, your uncle, Scrooge. With I've got to dinner. Will you let me in? Let him in? It is a mercy he didn't shake his arm right off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be more pleasant. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If only he could get there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming in late. That was the thing he had his heart set upon. And he did it too. The clock struck now. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. It was a full eighteen and a half minutes behind his time. Suddenly, Cratchit was there. His hat was off before he opened the door, and his comforter too, and he was on his stool in a dread jiffy, driving away with his pen as if trying to overtake nine o'clock. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> what do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I I'm very sorry, sir. I, I, I am behind my time. You are? Oh, yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. It, it's only once a year, sir. I, I was making rather merry yesterday. It shan't be repeated. Now, I'll tell you a thing or two, my fine fellow. I'm not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Scrooge leapt from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he stumbled backwards into the tank. And therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. <laughs> Tip, who did not die. 
He was a second father. He was as good a friend, as good a master, as good a man, as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town or borough in the good old world. Oh, some people laughed to see the alteration in him. But he let them laugh and little heeded them, for he was wise enough to know that nothing happens on this globe for good, at which some people do not have their fill of laughter at the onset. And, knowing that such as these would be blind in any case, he thought it just as well that they should wrinkle their eyes and grin in laughter, as had the malady themselves in less attractive form. His own heart laughed, and that was good enough for him. It was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well in his heart, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be true of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us.